Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show with Jason Hartman. You're about to learn a new slant on investing, some exciting techniques, and fresh new approaches to the world's most historically proven asset class that will enable you to create more wealth and freedom than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made multimillionaire who's actually been there and done it. He's a successful investor, lender, developer, and entrepreneur who's owned properties in 11 states, had hundreds of tenants and been involved in thousands of real estate transactions. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to your financial independence day. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome and greetings. This is episode number 1493. Boy, we're getting close to that magical 1500 episode number, aren't we? Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Well, our guest today will be James B. Steele. He is one of the most famous economic investigative journalists of all time. He won two Pulitzer Prizes, two National Magazine Awards, uh, and five George Polk Awards. Talk about credentials when he was at the Philadelphia Inquirer, Time, and Vanity Fair. And he's got multiple number one New York Times bestselling books. And today we're mostly going to talk to him about America, what went wrong, the crisis deepens. But, 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 what does that really mean to us? Well, just remember the rule of life. The people who live in the financialized economy and the people who are close to the money printers always benefit the most. And the good news is, if you're following my plan, you may not be an insider. You may not work on Wall Street. You may not work at the Federal Reserve or the U.S. Treasury. And you may not be Jamie Dimon or some other bankster, but you get to take advantage of that same benefit that they do, albeit maybe to a lesser degree. I'll be the first to admit that. The insiders are always going to get the biggest share of the money printing, but you definitely get to take advantage of it because you are following my plan. You are taking advantage of inflation-induced debt destruction. And what does that mean? That means you are brilliant. So congratulations for being brilliant. (laughs) Hey, uh, I'm going to tell you something about that in a moment, but I also don't want to forget to mention, you know, I had the pleasure of being on RT America somewhat recently, and I'm going to be on again today with Rick Sanchez. He is a really phenomenal journalist and reporter because, you know, he bucks the trend. He hasn't gone along with the mainstream media narrative. He's in the game, but he's also one of those people who's a voice of reason and a voice of reality in this crazy corporate controlled media that we we live in. It's just we have this bath of corporate run media and it's it's good. There are a few journalists like him. So I'm looking forward to that this afternoon. We're going to talk about forbearance and unemployment and mortgage credit availability and things like that. But relating to what I was just saying before we get to our guest, the crisis deepens. Well, the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is out with a new report. And guess what they're talking about? They're talking about debt, debt, debt. And debt, yeah, it's bad, it's good, it's mostly bad, but uh, for us it's good because we know how to game the system, essentially. And that makes debt my favorite four-letter word. (laughs) Yes, debt is my favorite four-letter word. You've heard me say that before. So what does this mean? Well, this IMF report is talking about how global debt will surpass 100% of global GDP. Now, you know, GDP means gross domestic product, and that usually applies to a country, but it's been applied to the entire planet, the entire human race. And that global GDP is between 80 and $100 trillion, I believe. No one looks at the global GDP, you know, too terribly much nowadays, but that's about where it is. So if global debt surpasses global GDP, what comparison do we have for that? Well, we have the U.S., 
And the U.S. is getting to that 100% of its own GDP. We have certain states, and we look at their GDP, which is, of course, all of the left-wing states, the Socialist Republic of California, my former home, uh, and other left-wing states. Well, they have the biggest debt problems. And unlike the U.S. government, they can't print their own money. They can't create a currency out of thin air. And they don't have the world's reserve currency, certainly. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, let's look at the nations. And let's look at the biggest debtor nation that is a big nation, a, a, an economy that really matters. And that would be the third largest economy in the world, formerly the second largest, but they, they slipped. And that is Japan. Japan's debt to GDP ratio is absolutely crazy, most people would say. It's 230% <laughs> debt to GDP, 230%. It's absolutely crazy. But, you know, the question is, what does this really mean? Well, the U.S. in a very enviable position, obviously, because it has the reserve currency. And no matter what anybody says, it's going to keep that reserve currency for a long, long time. So what does it mean? Well, let's look at what some people are saying and what the IMF is saying about this. In the U.S., we're running an especially lengthy tab having income to show for it. The IMF said of the U.S. budget deficit that it will reach nearly 24% of GDP this year. Now, remember, there's a difference between the debt and the deficit. The deficit is the annual thing. The debt is the overall thing. Okay, I think most of you know that, but I just want to, you know how I like to put it in very simple terms. So it's really obvious because reality and truth gets obscured in complexity. Let's not let that happen, okay? And then it goes on to say, while we're on the subject, the report also revised previous doom and gloom economic forecast for the doomier and gloomier. <laughs> it expects global GDP to decline 4.9% this year and U.S. GDP to slide by 8%. They don't think there's going to be a V-shaped recovery. Well, neither do I. Months have I predicted, and I'm still predicting, I'm standing by that prediction, that the recovery will be my modified square root recovery. Of course, we're going to talk a lot about this at our upcoming SOFA Summit. <laughs> That's our annual Meet the Masters, our 22nd anniversary Meet the Masters of Income Property event. We pushed the date back a couple of weeks, so it's going to start July 31st with a reception on Friday evening, and then we go that weekend, August 1st and 2nd. So save the date for that because you won't want to miss it. It's our first virtual conference, so that's going to be really exciting. We've got Harry Dent speaking, George Gammon speaking, and our client and professional actor, Sean Carroll, is the MC. You've heard him on the show before talking about his, his own case study. And we got a bunch of other speakers we're working on, but we cannot drop any names yet because, hey, it's not confirmed. So we don't want to do that. But save the date for that. July 31st, August 1st and 2nd, coming up, coming up. It's going to be really exciting. So this article goes on to say, so what do we do? The IMF advise governments to keep relief funds flowing. So in other words, so what about the debt? So what about the deficits? So what about their relationship to global GDP? Who cares? Keep the relief funds flowing. The Keynesian idea. Remember John Maynard Keynes, arguably the second most famous economist in history after Charles... <laughs> I almost said Charles Schwab. I don't know why I said that. No, after Marx, okay, Marxist, Marxist ideology. And Marx is sadly the most famous economist who ever lived, Karl Marx. And why is that? Well, because sadly his ideas caught on the most. And it's a bummer, a big bummer that they did because hundreds of millions of people suffered under Marxist ideology. But listen, give the guy credit. His economic ideas governed the former Soviet Union, the remaining few communist countries we still have left today, and really changed the world more than any other economist. So unfortunately, hopefully better ideas will win out as humanity goes forward. So keep the money flowing, the relief funds flowing, regardless of, of the, the debt and the deficits, okay? 
So that's what they say. And then uh, the IMF also said that governments could try to curb tax avoidance, broaden their tax bases, and potentially make their tax systems more, don't you love this word because it's such a complete misnomer, progressive. (laughs) Yeah, right. Definitely uh, progressive is usually regressive in terms of the real effects of their taxation. Definitely, definitely true. But that's, you know, things get a moniker, they get a, they get a name and like everybody believes it, uh, you know, it's, it's crazy how that happens. But they say that the bottom line is countries that control their own currency, like the U.S., are at an advantage when it comes to managing debt. The money printers at the Fed can always make sure the federal government is able to borrow. Yes, they can. You are definitely right about that. And that's why the U.S. can defy gravity for, I say, decades to come. Who knows, maybe even centuries to come before this debt really becomes the problem it should become. We live in an illogical world. It doesn't make sense. It's like that old movie about the Kinks, a, uh, an old great band. They have a movie. It's called Stop Making Sense, an old movie. And it's pretty good, by the way. Check it out. Uh, So, yeah, we live in a world of unreality. We really do. So there's the update on debt and deficits. And be sure you align your interests with these great powers that be, the most powerful forces the human race has ever known, governments and central banks, with standing armies. And it's not going to change. So align your interests with them. How do you do that? You do that by following my investing plan. The plan we've been outlining on this show for the past 15 years and the plan I've been teaching for the last 17 years, that is explained. And by the way, if you're new to the show, be sure, or you just want a review of the fundamentals, be sure to check out our uh, sister podcast. It's the Quick Start Podcast. So just type in Jason Hartman Quick Start on any podcast platform and you'll find it on iTunes, etc. And that is a podcast where we we go over more of the fundamental ideas. Because here we talk a lot about current events and interview various guests like we're going to interview today. But if you just want a review of the fundamentals or to be introduced to the fundamentals, the Quick Start podcast is your place to get that. So you can listen to both. They're obviously both free, and check those out. Also, many of you have asked for this. I mentioned it yesterday, but hugely popular webinar on asset protection, asset defense, tax savings, and estate planning. You can get that at jasonhartman.com slash asset. That's jasonhartman.com slash asset for that webinar. Anyway, without further ado, here's our guest today, James B. Steele. It's my pleasure to welcome James B. Steele. He is one of the most famous economic investigative journalists of all time. He's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, two National Magazine Awards, and five George Polk Awards, while at the Philadelphia Inquirer, Time, and Vanity Fair, multiple number one New York Times bestsellers, including The Betrayal of the American Dream, Howard Hughes, His Life and Madness, and his newest book, America, What Went Wrong?, the crisis deepens. James, welcome. How are you? Great to be with you. I'm fine. It's good to have you on. You know, off air a little bit before we started, we were talking about how the middle class has just been decimated over the past couple of decades. Until 2017, Americans, typical middle class Americans, hadn't had a real dollar pay increase for four decades. What is going on? Is this by design? If so, whose design? Uh, how can it be? It is a range of things that have brought this about. But the, the principal things are Washington and, and, frankly, Wall Street. It has been in the interest of both to uh, put various programs in place, which have been very detrimental to the middle class. Part of it has been dere- – a lot of it was deregulation, various industries, airline, trucking, certain financial industries created all kinds of problems with home ownership as well as debt and so forth. That's one. Uh, The tax system, in our mind, is the single greatest driver of income inequality in this country. Most of the tax benefits that have flowed in in the last few years have gone to really upper income people or 
corporations. Now, corporations would love not to pay any taxes at all. But the numbers are staggering here. You go back just a few decades, companies paid roughly 40% of the total income tax bill. Today, this year, it's going to be less than 10%. Now, that's all pre-COVID we're talking about. I mean, COVID has, of course, changed everything in this whole equation. But that shrinkage is, is shifted everything onto the backs of, of individuals, both middle class and certainly upper income individuals who pay a sizable part of, the, of all income taxes. Is a lot of that the way the corporations are getting away with paying a lot less? Is it because they're doing all these offshore schemes like the double Irish twist and the, they've got all this money offshore? It's like it used to be that a corporation of a certain country or a baseball team of a certain city was like the hometown team. Now these multinationals just go from one jurisdiction to another, figuring out how to screw every government and not pay anything. It's unbelievable. And at the same time, the people who run those corporations are, you know, are spouting these leftist ideas that, you know, we need more taxes. But it's just incoherent. I I don't get it. Well, I think you're right about the hometown image is a perfect one because I think a lot of corporations were attached to whatever whatever town they were in, even though they might have been national in scope. And all that's been out the window. And half the corporations, some of them are not even domestically owned anymore, and which most people don't even realize in that case. So that's a lot, a big part of it. A, a lot of it has been, certainly the global economy has been a huge factor in this and a lot of the earnings abroad. When you say the global economy, do you mean trade deals that have offshored American jobs? That's part of it. And then other parts of it are just the companies who are just basically selling abroad as well. So it's really both sides of the equation. I mean, the 2017 tax bill had the repatriation of the funds that were sitting in big offshore accounts that all kinds of multinational corporations like Apple, Google, and others had offshore, and also manufacturing companies as well. For a very low tax rate, they were allowed to bring these this money, a certain percentage of it, back to the U.S. But the Federal Reserve Bank of New York studied this, among others, I don't think of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York as exactly a left link tank, right? They studied this, and they concluded that most of the money came back, went into stock buybacks, dividends for those corporations. In other words, the money isn't plowed back in to the real operation of the company. It's flowing through a very small number of people who benefited from that money coming back. So they got a lower tax rate to bring it back, and they didn't do anything to really help with that. Another one of the problems that we see, because money isn't being invested back into the country as a whole. Only the various elite, only the very wealthy, not always by design, but by the way it works out in practice, they're getting the benefit from this. And that's not going to, I don't see how that can continue over a period of time, because the middle classes increasingly will get poorer and poorer. I mean, look at median family income. When we did the first edition of this book many years ago, median family income was around 34000 If it had kept pace, and this was 1992, and if it kept pace with uh, just the cost of living in that time, median family income today would be around sixty eight, sixty nine thousand. 69000 Yeah, and it's only about fifty four, fifty six thousand, 56000 right? It's, well, it's 61, but it's based on the 2017 figure. But another way, another way that's really much worse than it sounds is that those inflation numbers are understated. I mean, we all know that the government is manipulating the index to make it look better than it is. Right. If, if those were the real inflation numbers, I would just, in my head math, say that that median income would need to be about ninety, ninety-five thousand dollars today to equal what it was in the early nineties. But also notice that in the early nineties, when you wrote the original book, um, that the pay increases in real dollars stopped in nineteen seventy-seven. That's right. It's dramatically worse. And then no, you- to add insult to injury, and you can comment on this, the pay of the C-level executives, the boards of directors became just dramatically out of sync with regular workers. And I'm not talking minimum wage workers even. I'm just talking middle management people. It's like there's this giant separation. You're absolutely right. In fact, it's one of the most shocking numbers, I think, in this new book of ours. Peter Drucker studied this whole issue of CEO many years ago, and he thought the optimum ratio would have been 20 to 1 for 
And now it's like $300 to one, 400 to one. Person on the on the factory floor or the, the or even middle of management would get a dollar, 20 to one. When we did the first edition of this book back in the early 1990s, it was then up to 89 to one. It's almost four times. Some estimates now have it over 300. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know. I know. It's like it's 300. Three, it's, it's just cycled way beyond what even we thought was going to happen when we wrote this book. People attacked us at the time. I said, well, you're you're against success. You're, you're against know, capitalism. You're against capitalism, right? I've you're heard those arguments. I've even made those arguments myself, but now I realize that I was wrong. Because we need a good middle class. That's what's one of the things that has made this country great is a strong middle class. Otherwise, we have, guess what? Civil unrest. We have a lot of unhappy people. And they're going to they're gonna burn cars and take over downtown Seattle, sadly. But, but how did it happen? Okay, so trade agreements, understating inflation, Wall Street monopolies, the financialization of the economy. I mean, take us into that in more depth. And it was a... A theme that began to develop really in the 70s by a lot of the very conservative think tanks that began to seep into the body politic uh, that had to do with deregulation, the idea that government is filled with red tape and it's cumbersome, it's not efficient for gov- for business to operate this way. So there are a whole range of things like that, and it's sort of feeding its way into the tax system. The fewer taxes, it means there's more money to invest. But yet when they started crafting these bills, most of the breaks went to people at the top to, to therefore make those investments and so forth. So it's a whole series of things slowly over a period of time. At the same time, things like Social Security are not really significantly increased the way they should be. I mean, half the retirees basically depend on Social Security. That is their only retirement benefit. And Social Security has essentially been pretty much flat for a long time now. Every time there's an increase, it's offset by increases in Medicare, which comes out of everybody's Social Security check as well. So it's a range of things like that, but it was a mindset, government's evil, uh, government's a problem, uh, let's let the free market determine everything. I think the free market has been wonderful for America. It has given us a variety of wonderful things, but it cannot solve this problem. And I think what we're in right now is perfect proof it can't solve this problem. The virus, I think, as much as anything else, exposed just how vulnerable we are in this country. I mean, the the vast bulk of people in the middle class, working classes. Do you remember uh, right after COVID struck and businesses began to lay off workers? Do you remember those photos that you saw on TV of lines of cars waiting to get boxes of food? These weren't people who were rounded up under viaducts as homeless people, middle-class people. I mean, they're, people are just hanging on. I mean, the, the other great study of the New York Fed was the one that's uh, a couple of years ago that said uh, 47 or 48% of the people are faced with an emergency, $400, they don't have the cash. They don't have the money. I mean, what does that tell you about where we are? I don't think too many people would deny that there's a problem. So maybe we don't need to spend that much more time on it. But I I totally agree. There's a problem. Absolutely. So let's just go back to a couple things you mentioned. You talked about how the benefits accrued to a very small number of people and companies. And then, you know, the argument being that, well, they all invest that money. And that argument does have at least conceptual validity because investment is wealth formation. And the old saying, you know, money doesn't sleep, or maybe it does. I don't know. I don't think it does. Because if rich people have money, they can't just do nothing with the money. They're going to invest it. And that investment is going to, and I hate to say this, but trickle down <laughs> um, to somebody. It's going to, uh, It's going to build more houses. It's going to build more factories, create more jobs. I mean, isn't that true? There, it, it is true that obviously if you invest it in that particular way, as opposed to just perhaps just more dividends or higher pay for your CEO or buying back your stock at the company, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that's why the 2017 tax bill, which gave these big corporations that had all this money offshore a break. I mean, I wish that, had, that money coming back had been policed, but it did exactly what you're talking about, really invested in the U.S., Instead, it was invested in stock buybacks 
bigger dividends, things of that sort, rather than maybe building another plant, launching another division, something like that, not just buying an existing company. So I agree with you. And I think that's one of the things that you do see about American capitalism. It's obviously been very aggressive and very successful in a whole range of reasons. I think all we're saying in the book is that it's not enough. That alone is not enough anymore. We need more a more active government to do the things it can do. And that's what the virus exposed. I mean, the free market was totally unable to handle this, and understandably so. It's a national problem that crosses state lines, crosses corporate lines, and globally as well, absolutely. But at least in, in the case of our own sense, the U.S., we didn't have something in place or anything close to being in place to think about a way to handle it. So there's a, there is a role for the government, not just for that, but think about the government dealing with the middle class on that same basis. That's what I would like to see. Think of those issues that are really harming the middle class. Healthcare is a big one. I mean, that could be solved. That could take a lot of those expenses off. How would it be solved? Uh, Well, Don and I have advocated for years a single payer system. That's probably not on the radar, uh, even if the Democrats win Congress coming up. But I mean, you are aware of all the criticisms of those systems in, in Canada, the UK. I mean, you know, you die waiting in line, you know, no innovation. The Canadian criticisms are way, way off base. And I, the reason I know this in part, my sister's lived in Canada for 40 years. So I, I actually know what goes on up there. You have in Canada, you wait if you need a hip replacement. But if you're seriously ill, you do not wait in Canada. And actually, most of the public opinion polls in Canada show Canadians are more, that system has a higher approval rate than our own. So that alone tells you something that the UK is a problem. But look at the single payer systems in France and Germany, very high level of medicine, very high level of care. So it it can be done. To be fair, though, France and Germany and Europe in general is a disaster. And Canada doesn't have the type of immigration. They have a much smaller population. You know, there's so many differences. No, there are differences in all of these places. But I don't, and Germany is in you know, certainly a downturn now, but don't ever underestimate the Germans, what they're going to do there. And, and France, I think, is consistently, uh, people underestimate in some ways the, the internal strength of, of much of that country. Certainly the healthcare system. If you have any doctor friends who know French doctors, they will tell you the French medical system is a very high level, very, very high quality. But anyway, back to the main point. The single payer could be in many different ways. The UK, they actually pay the doctors. You, you don't have to do it that way. It could be a whole range of other things. The Canadians who are criticized, you can go to any doctor you want in Canada. You can't do that in the U.S. today, depending on what your plan is. So there's, you know, there's mixes and matches here all over the place. On the healthcare thing, you know, there are just two things we could do that would just be s- simple first steps. Number one, and that's what Trump has been working on, is make the pricing transparent. Like, how yeah. in the world did we get to this stupid system where the patient is detached from the cost of everything? In no other area of life does it work that way. When I take my dog to the vet, I evaluate treatment based on knowing the cost and I can call another vet and shop. You know, you get the insurance in there, this other party. And it's like, you know, I go to the doctor and it's like, run every test you want. I don't care. I'm not paying for it. It's just a silly system. And then let the insurance companies sell across state lines to increase competition. I I don't have any problem with that at all. And in fact, book that Don and I wrote about healthcare 15 years ago talked about The oddity, if you were standing in a line to buy groceries, if you had a box of cereal that was $2, why did the guy behind you, that same box, why is it $5? It's like airline tickets. And so, you know, there's no doubt, there's tons of things that could be done. But I think one of the most important things would be to to figure out a way to to get these costs down for middle class people who actually even have insurance, let alone provide it for the ones who don't have because we do spend more, as you know so well, more than anybody else in the world. So healthcare is one. Obviously, jobs are another. I think student loans are an area that is just crying out. We're never going to forgive all the student loans. So it's a total scam. I mean, the way we have indebted these young people and, and older people, too, uh, right. but especially young, to $1.5 trillion in non-dischargeable student debt, that's a crime. 
that it's a criminal activity. All those companies that have done those student loans should be indicted. It's, it's ridiculous. But, you know, you have a fascinating table of contents. And, you know, there's so much to talk about here and time is limited. But you talk about the casualties of the new economic order, downward mobility. You talk about the paper jobs and, you know, the $500 an hour bankruptcy lawyers, the, the global money men who are beyond the law. Who are the global money men, by the way? This was one in the earlier in the earlier edition. This was the late Mark Rich, who made a lot of money on oil trading and also owned a, a steel plant in West Virginia, where he uh, basically um, it was a year and a half strike that just about bankrupted the town and half the workers there. Who they eventually it's one of the few labor victories at the time where eventually Rich threw in the sponge and said, "Okay, you guys win, and I'll sell and get out of here." But that, he was one. But there there are of course many and. All you have to do is go to the Cayman Islands or any of those places down there, and you'll see plenty of them on the mailboxes as well. Absolutely. So it's the offshore games, all the tax games and and those types of things. Right. Uh, I mean, has the American dream ended or is there some hope here? I think there's always hope if we do the right thing. And I think it, w- it would not be easy and it cannot be done in a year or two, but it could be done. I mean, if we set a plan to figure out a way, what are the kinds of social safety net we can provide for the middle class? It doesn't have to be a huge thing, but something that makes sure when something like this happens, we don't have people lined up for three miles getting boxes of food. There's got to be another way to do that particular kind of thing. I think the other thing, which is maybe at the top of the list, right alongside healthcare, is retirement. Retirement is a huge, unbelievable freight train catastrophe coming down the tracks right now. I mean, the Motley Fool just in the last day or two hit a piece on the Gen X's, what shape they're in. Everybody sort of knew the groups before, after them had, were in trouble. The death of pensions and the shifting over to the self-directed 401ks and 403s, all of this has been more convenient for companies, but it's going to be a disaster for workers down the line because those funds, and there's nothing wrong with those funds, but they're just not going to produce the earnings. They're not going to produce the return that people need in the middle class, like pensions did of old. The other thing that we need to do is to increase Social Security for those people that need it. You know, 50% of Americans, Social Security is their principal uh, retirement, and their only retirement. There's many things that could be done, can't all be done in one year, but something other than just lip service to the fact that the middle class needs help. Jim, all those things, it would be great, but they all cost money. And we are running huge deficits, huge debt. With with coronavirus, it got much worse. Doesn't money printing cause problems? I mean, can you just do that? And these things have consequences, right? You can't can't do it all at once. But I think we're going to have to figure out one or two things to do. I think we need to invest in a way that creates jobs. I mean, the simple thing that Don and I have been talking about for years is infrastructure. Uh, And a lot of people, Democrats and Republicans, both talk about that. That's certainly one, not just roads and bridges, but other kinds of things, you know, high speed telecommunications and a whole range of things, maybe parts of the green uh, energy concept. But there's there's ways to do things, but you have, you have to make some targets and stick with them. Can't do it all in one year, but we need to at least start thinking about this other than just wringing our hands about it. So if the government is going to give people money, I mean, I couldn't agree with you, you know, that the New Deal concept was okay, you know, put people to work. You know, that just doesn't seem to happen anymore. The government just gives out money and says, stay home and become a lazy loser. You know, that, that's basically well, what the plan has been the last you know, five decades. Well, the, I think that's been true we've seen this year after the virus in particular. But that's the kind of thing where I think if we had national plans for something like this and thought about it, we might be able to respond to that better rather than just printing these checks now and sending. I mean, people are getting the money now. It's good because they're in bad shape. But that's not the solution. The solution is trying to figure out what is the foundation that makes the middle class viable again? What are those jobs and what are those benefits? Uh, You know, I mean, it's sort of easy to answer that. It's jobs onshore. It's higher paying, higher skilled jobs and having a newfound respect for vocational type jobs. Absolutely. What's wrong with being a plumber? 
You know, no. I don't want to do the job, but there are people out there that want to do it. And we have just destroyed so many of these jobs. You're right. And, you know, frankly, that's the Trump agenda. Love him or hate him, but that has been part of his plan to give those jobs a new level of respect. Why do people need to go to university, get a degree in feminist studies that has no job market and be $70,000 in debt to a, a silly student loan? Absolutely. Couldn't agree. Couldn't agree with you more on that. Not and everybody I, needs to go to college. <laughs> and, no, no. And, and, and a lot of people have been making that point for a long, long time. And I think and that's a very valid one. And I think his his focus on trade has been a positive thing in the sense I mean, Don, I've been writing about trade for years. And by the way, you keep referring to Don. That's your co-author. co-author yeah. right. And we were writing about free trade and, and some of the, the disasters it created years ago. And my goodness, did we get hammered. The Wall Street Journal's editorial page attacked us. They're crazy free traders. I mean, there's any restriction on free trade in their book is like heresy. You just can't do that. Anyway, and our only point was you can't have this unrestricted it is one-sided and we've been we've been writing that for years and years so that part of his, his agenda i think has been positive i think the way he's gone about it though has been uh, not positive yeah, of, and, and what do you mean by that like picking uh, fights with china these war of well, words I, I, I think if you're going to pick a fight with china the europeans are as upset with china as we are i mean you all get together but instead he's been a total go it alone on everything and I think that's one where if you were working together with others, you might really get some results. But I think Chinese are thinking, we'll just, we'll just outlast this guy. And it sounds like you would be critical of Clinton's free trade policies, I'm guessing, right? Not well, no. The one thing people forget about Clinton, and you saw this in the Trump-Hillary Clinton debates, I mean, what people forget is that NAFTA was a fait accompli when Bill Clinton took office. NAFTA was negotiated by George H.W. Bush. People forget that. It wasn't Bill Clinton. It was done deal. And I'm not unsympathetic to the problems of a president at that point saying, well, I'm not going to sign this. You had not just the Wall Street Journal, but every other damn editorial page on your neck. Well, Trump did it. You know, he got out of the, the TPP. Yeah. And he endured some criticism for that, partly because, uh, but anyway, all I'm saying is, I think Clinton, in that sense, was a different era and didn't really have much choice at that point. But look at the new NAFTA that Trump is doing. I mean, that's USMC. It's, it's NAFTA light. So it's, it's better than the old one, but not that much better. I don't think it's much better than the old one. One of the breakthroughs in it is that we can now sell wine in British Columbia state stores. That's my favorite. <laughs> There's always some special interest in there, There's right? always some special, right? <laughs> so I'm not so sure that's going to be a big job generator in the U.S. anyway. Yeah, you never know. You never know. And, you never know. and most of Mexico is, is is related to the auto industry and the auto, and the auto workers. Are, they don't see any benefits really in this thing to mount anything. So anyway, it's at most a draw, a lot of sound and fury signifying, I think, very little ultimately. But uh that's either here or there at this point. These things are definitely complicated. Hey, as you wrap up, just give us any prediction on the future. Inflation, deflation, stagflation. I kind of think we're moving into a stagflationary period. Uh, reminds me of the misery index and Jimmy Carter era coming up. But uh, what, do you, what do you think? I'm not an economist on issues of deflation and inflation. And in fact, I'm not so sure many economists are, more, are very attuned to this one anymore because everybody has been worrying about inflation for years and it's just never happened. Yeah. I, mean, it, I, I mean, it has happened a little bit to be A fair. little bit. It's a tiny. And, but when you think of not what like it they should, talk, what it not, like, not like some say, you know, hyperinflation hasn't happened. I think we're going to be obviously in a very, very weakened condition for a long time. There's just no way you come out of this virus robustly, despite the silliness that's going on in the stock market right now. I mean, this has no relationship to what is really happening in the economy. It just shows you how people grab on the slightest bit of good news and say, wow, let's go with that. But I think the underlying problems are still there, and it's going to take us a long time to work our way through this. The other shifts are, like you mentioned, I think commercial real estate, or maybe I'm imagining this, but uh, I mean, what's going to happen there? It's uh, a disaster. I mean, there, a, there are going to be so many commercial mortgage-backed securities defaults, it's going to be staggering. Exactly. And that's, there's no way I can see doing much about that because it's 
this is what's going to happen. It's just a fundamental change. Look, at we do have a housing shortage. There's no question about that. No one would disagree with that. And, you know, you complained about deregulation, but maybe a little less regulation there would actually help people have some housing. And if we could rezone some of these office and retail properties that aren't going to be used as office and retail properties anymore and turn them into housing at a sure. reasonable price without a bunch of complex codes and city planning and, you know, hiring a zillion lawyers and environmental impact people, just let people live somewhere. I mean, my God, the homeless problem is insane. The cost of housing is absolutely crazy. That's an area where maybe we need some deregulation. Well, and a lot of that is is local regulation as much as, as, as national. So, and, and I'm not for one minute saying uh, that there are some things that can be deregulated here and there. I mean, I think we've all seen examples of that. I'm just saying, I, I think in the case of some of those industries, we went a little bit too far. And I, you just look at trucking. Trucking continues to be a catastrophe now, 40 years after it's deregulated. I mean, the hundreds of thousands. Basically, it, the, the number of companies that went in and out of that industry was regulated. The ICC uh, was the principal regulator. And once those were relaxed, everybody was a trucking company. So literally in the last 40 years, there have been thousands of these companies going. And it's really, in many cases, a case of excessive competition. It's like, if you've ever read any of the biographies of the first John Rockefeller, his whole goal was to reduce competition. Competition was constantly producing lower returns or no returns for everybody in the business. So what trucking has been, I mean, look at all the big companies. Most of them have gone out of business in the last few years. And the ones that survive, maybe survive for a little longer, and then they go out of business. Just chronic chaos, chronically trying to retrain drivers. What the drivers make now is a pittance compared to what they made like 30, 40 years ago, adjusted for inflation. Well, people could argue the same thing about airlines, but the other side of that is that it's a lot cheaper to fly. And, and I'm, you know, we'll go pre-COVID on this. I, I mean, what's happened now is well, a little... But, but it's come out of the hides of the people who work for those industries. Sure, yeah. it, but the consumer can go places. Yeah, just like mm -hmm. deregulation in trade, you can buy cheap stuff on Amazon and at Walmart, but and that's, you're not going to have a job. That, and that's always the trade-off, the way you figure out how much of this you can live with, how much you can't. Right. And, um, so we get back to that. Okay, fair enough. Jim, wrap it up for us and give out your website if you would. The website is Barlett and Steel, B-A-R-L-E-T-T -T and Steel. Most people want to put a T in Don's name, is call him Bartlett, but it's Barlett. That has this book and, of course, any of the others, but this book is just out. And it's really a clarion call in my book to saying we've got a tremendous crisis here that is worsening, intensifying, and we're going to have to figure out a way to get on it. The book was essentially written before the virus, but the virus in some ways has exposed the need to think about these things more than ever in my book. So. It has definitely accelerated that. Jim Steele, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be with you, Jason. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.